not Jack White. That's the guy that came over. With his cute wife. Oh, loud buzzing noise. Okay, so something's still going on. Nah. I don't know why. Every time the audio is different. Uh, let me see. Okay, so I don't have... So loud buzzing noise? Say about now. Oh, wow. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I could just do the webcam mic, keep it simple. Okay. Yeah. How's that? So I'm largely going to do questions from everyone today. Um, I've got Kim here, of course, and I've got my parents, Kevin and Sandy. So they are reluctantly here, so be <laughs> nice to them. Um, they were in town for the weekend. They came for ABC last weekend, um, so they attended that competition. If you guys were there, you might have seen them hanging around. And um, they're here for this live stream just to, you know, hang out and see what it's all about. Um, I've got crippling depression back there, so if you want to see what it looks like um, before I do the full tear down, I can swap the camera around and show you that. Uh, if you have any questions from ABC or anything else, just let me know. And Kim will start us off. All right, we have our first question from TML Productions. Yeah. First things first, 80 amps in a beetle. Are you planning on shattering the Lexan? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try my very best to shatter the Lexan with um, anxiety attack. So 80 amps um, is what I was talking about in um, um, Ben Hayes' video that he published yesterday, Team Panic. Um, the weapon is around 50 to 60 amps, somewhere around there. And then I've got uh, 20 amp ESCs on each of the drive because I'm doing brushless drive. So 80 is kind of my theoretical number that the whole system needs to be able to provide at peak 80 amps. But yeah, it's going to be pretty, um, pretty scary. And I've actually got the weapon set up over in my test box so I could do a little quick spin up if anyone is interested in that. Yeah. 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 So just let me know, say the word, it's right over there, just gotta plug it in. <laughs> Honey. I think people are still True. getting in, not many questions yet. Okay. Cool. Cool. I mean, you could kind of maybe run through the damage. Oh, uh, yeah. And the Spoodle will be, would be interested in it as well. Spoodle. 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 Yeah, let's just go over to the, let me see if I got the cable on enough, but yeah, let's just go over to the damage. So you guys entertain that for a second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go on a journey, everyone. Excuse me, dog. So in 
unfortunately, this camera doesn't really go bend down very easily. Can you hold it? Yeah, if you want to hold it. We'll see. We'll try our best to get a video of this. Yes, you got your monitor behind you. So this is the weapon for anxiety attack. Let me just pull the leg sound away. Um, this is also my test arena, which you might have seen previously. So the weapon blade is just under a pound. I think it's like 0.9 or something like that. And yes, I do have a um, carbon fiber prop on top for downforce. I think it's mounted the wrong way, but that is the basic setup. Of course, we have the banana for scale. This is um, 12 and a half inches long. So let me grab my radio and get this thing on. And this whole thing is going to be running at 4S. Um, I, it was really difficult to find batteries and everything that I need for 4S, but I made my own custom battery, so that helped. All my pieces went everywhere. Okay. And so this isn't full charge on the battery. It really, really needs full charge to get the best spin up, but. And so we're sitting at about that much throttle. Um, this guy is my punch it. So if I hit this, this will go straight to full power. So let's do that. And so at full power, this is running, I think, about 400 miles an hour is the tip speed. So really, really, really fast. Um, I'm doing this for stabilization and also to give me that extra downforce. And this enclosure is oddly soundproof. So if I give a little bit of an opening, you can hear it better. That is anxiety attack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's um I'll give you a context here when it spins down. It takes a little while to spin down. And here it is next to Kamikaze's blade, so you can see that it is substantially larger um, than the blade on Kamikaze. It weighs a lot less, but even though it weighs a lot less, the um, overall kinetic energy is actually higher than that of Kamikaze. So it's um, you know another good six inches longer. So that is Anxiety Attack. Um, you are planning to direct drive it, right? Uh, yes. Yes. So, I'll grab that. So let's go. <laughs> Usually, it's your destruction says time to procrastinate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I will be direct driving um, the weapon motor for anxiety attack, but I'm doing it maybe a little bit differently. Let me see if I can find the keys. So, here is the. Um, hello again. Here is the um, weapon motor mount for anxiety attack. So this is a uh, machined piece of aluminum and that actually attaches down into the motor itself down there. There's a channel for the wire to come out 
Eh, somewhere over there. And then this is bearings that sit against the can. And then you've got a titanium ring around there. So hopefully this whole thing will help stabilize that motor and not make it just explode on impact. And this is about the overall height of anxiety attack. It's going to be about one and a half inches tall. We have a few questions on this box, so we'll get those uh, since it's relevant. Sure. Um, do you anticipate issues getting a bite on the other robot at that speed? Yeah. Um, so at that speed, anything over about 200 miles an hour, uh, you're probably not going to get as much of a bite because it's just going to be like a solid blur and you'll just kind of chip away a little bit. So I don't really expect to get these solid big hits at that speed. However, it's always nice to have that extra amount of power. Um, so I'll probably run it a lot slower. The extra power is actually for the downforce um, so that hopefully I don't get pushed around as much. But yeah, there is going to be some issues with it, but it is very, very large and it is just a bar. So hopefully that should help. Um, on that note, how much downforce does the prop generate? <clears throat> so I have a few different prop options. I haven't yet um, weighed them. I'm going to make like a little 3D printed cup that actually sits over top of my scale so that I can turn it on and actually measure the downforce on it on a scale. But in theory, the larger prop, which is not that one, has like one and a half kilos of downforce. So it's about three pounds. So hopefully I expect to get one and a half to two pounds actual downforce out of that. And so the extra two pounds, it will feel more like a five pounder. It's kind of what I'm hoping for. Um, Tonto asks, what kind of gyroscopic wobble are you expecting while moving with the blade at full power? Yeah, so gyroscopic wobble when moving with the blade at full power, hopefully none. Hopefully. Um, these things do tend to wobble a little bit, um, or if they get like off-centered when you see like gigabyte or something like that, they start processing like in a wobble pattern. I hope to not have much of that with the downforce. Um, and also it's pretty well stabilized inside, you know, it's, there's not a lot of um, wiggle room there, I guess, and it's going to be pretty flat. So hopefully I won't see much, but if it gets lifted up on one end and starts wobbling, it could be interesting. So we'll see. But it's, it's so short that hopefully that won't be much of an issue, but we'll see. Um, somebody asked about, uh, won't you, let me see who that was. Um, boop, 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 boop. Asking about if you're going to damage the motors if it's direct drive. Yeah, I, I fully expect to damage some motors, um, being that it is direct drive. I thought a lot about doing direct drive versus a belt, and unfortunately the problem with adding a belt or a gear or anything like that is you have your motor that sits on this plane, right? And then you have the belt or the pulley or gears or whatever that sits on top of that, and then the weapon has to sit on top of that. So you're adding at least, at the very least, like a quarter inch height to where that weapon has to now come up even further. So I wanted to keep the weapon as low as possible. Uh, so that's why I went with the direct drive. I am worried about damaging the motor. However, the setup that I have with that little cup that I showed, there's going to be a lot of epoxy in there, and it's actually going to be epoxy to that bottom plate. And with the bearings on the side, hopefully it won't get as much shock. Um, it's also not going to be directly mounted to the weapon. I have another machined piece that interfaces with the uh, weapon and interfaces with the motor. So hopefully I'm trying to mitigate some of that shock that's going to happen. Um, one more anxiety attack uh, question, then I'll go back to the first ones. Okay. Um, are you going to be driving four-wheel drive, two-wheel drive, and what motors? Asks. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I'm going to be doing four-wheel drive um, so two motors, belt driven, so four wheel drive, you know, four wheels, two motors, so two wheel drive, four wheel drive, however you want to say that. Um, I am using the Servo City 22 millimeter gearboxes that I've removed the brushed motor from, <coughs> and I'm using um, AeroDrive SK3 22118s, I think. Um, Are you serious? You just rattled that off? Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. I'll grab it. I think that's what it is. I think it's a um, AeroDrive SK3 2-1-1-8. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you got a tunnel from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's in here. Oh, that's really small. <laughs> so.
So here is the little setup, and I think that's what these are. Wow. Two 118s, 3100. So it's a 3100 um, KV motor, and this is just the standard uh, planetary gearbox from Servo City. And then these little hubs, or um, pulleys, these are actually um, custom made. I got these done through Shapeways with um, that new HP Design Jet printer. Um, so these are pretty cool. And I have these little um, key pins in them, and those key into the Bainbot wheel hubs. Um, so then I don't have to rely on the flat. Um, I can actually drive it like that. So, yeah, so that's my little gearbox setup. Um, but it will be, these are the 8th inch um, belts, O-ring belts that I'm using, and those will drive the other motors. All right, Zach asks, how much of Crippling Depression's frame is reusable, or do you need to rebuild most of it? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, moving on. Um, <laughs> so Zach asked about Crippling Depression, how much is reusable? Um, nothing. How about you show it? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll show it. Um, absolutely nothing from the frame, nothing from the structure I'm going to reuse. It is 100% uh, toast. So let's see. And there it is. So everything, it's, it sounds a little interesting, um, but everything actually does quote unquote, um, still work. I can actually power this up and drive it around to show and prove to people. Um, but yeah, it does actually work. Um, but you see there should be an internal frame right here. It is completely missing. Um, there is the other frame over here and you can see it's um, bent in just a little bit. <laughs> and then um, the external frame we can see is pretty well screwed up. Um, this really shouldn't be like that. And then the other side, let's see if you can see this. Yeah, you can see the gap here. I can actually fit my fingers inside the gap and this is not being held on. It's only being held in the back, but it's held in here and you can see how it tilts and warps along. So this piece is gone. Um, the back, let me show that. Um, this back actually isn't too bad, but you can see a nice bubble right there, mostly um, because it's being held in here, so this whole side warped a little bit. And then we'll do it top down. Internally though, it looks pretty good. The front part of this frame is missing, that's, you know, not a big deal, that'll buff out. Um, the Drive pods themselves have been separated, so they've been kind of compromised. I can remake um, new UHMW pieces. All the internals on these are just fine, um, but the outer UHMW needs a little bit of help. And um, these panels, you know, you can just see how warped this one is. Let me get better top down. So yeah, it just kind of warps out to the side. So need a new one, need a new one, new, new, new. Well, the front's over here, so. That needs to be a new one. Um, and here's what the front ended up looking like. Uh, these are the cuts and the gouges from a couple hits from Beam. And here is his impactor. So you can see it fits nicely inside of these little gouges. And this is what ended up taking the whole front off. So yeah, it's going to need a little bit of repair. Um, but it did what it was supposed to do, so that's good. And this panel... So if we lay it flat, you can see it is bowed up pretty, pretty bad. So on that note, uh, Ryan Go asked, how did Crippling Depression survive beams attacks? The front panel is off. Mm -hmm. So you might go into how it's set up. Yeah, so let me, yeah, I'll just keep it here. So I survived beams attacks mostly because these drive pods didn't really get that damaged. So they still spin, um, largely because they're self-contained inside these little things. I can actually pull out the drive pods and we did um, to do the repairs. The wheels still run fine. So this inner piece that kind of lines everything up, the wheels were still able to drive. Now in terms of um, beam itself, 
we basically went tip to tip. So if we look at the actual weapon, uh, you can see that I've kind of ground this down to almost a little bit of a point, and that's because I was actually going tip to tip with the impactors of Beam, and this is one of his little um, teeth that he had. So when we were going tooth to tooth, the disc was just a lot more sound and stable, and it ended up um, breaking his tooth off, and then he became unbalanced, and obviously his wheels were exposed. I clipped one of his wheels <coughs> early on. So yeah, it was just a combination of, I guess, durability. He couldn't get my wheels to stop driving, so I just kind of kept coming at him. Even though pieces were falling off, I was still able to keep driving at him. So I think that's kind of just how it went. Asking for a friend who had a slice taken out of a battery and it shorted across his chassis. Oh, yeah, battery fires. I've been... So, how do I deal with them for venting them, I'm assuming? Um, so, I've been very, very lucky, um, but at the same time, I also prepared quite a bit for that. So, here is the internals of crippling depression. Let me a bit. There we go. And this is where the battery lives. I don't have one of the batteries handy, but it sits right here. There's foam in the back. Um, it's pressed up against um, these two things, which are the Nylon X um, filament. I have a foam piece up here. This is really dense foam. And then there's another piece of foam that lives down here, and the battery just lays in this little channel. I am extremely vulnerable to overhead attacks since this is just carbon fiber up top and it's you know pretty thin and then I just have the carbon fiber on the bottom. So I have my battery very centrally located, a hit from the back, the wedge is in place, and a hit from the front, you know, the battery is still quite a ways away. So it's as far into the inside as it can, and if there's an overhead attack, that's what this big overhead bar is. If there's going to be any chance of a direct attack on here, I will run this configuration, and theoretically, this weapon will prevent any damage from getting into the battery compartment. So that's kind of how I deal with it. Uh, in design or also theory. Gotcha. So, who is that? Pierce. Pierce. So, Pierce was asking about my 250, my theoretical 250. Um, ABC took a lot out of me. It was a lot of work for both of us, and obviously you know that I haven't been doing videos lately because of that. It's kind of just, you know, on hold. I still don't know what design is best. I can come up with a design that will work and do well at BattleBots, but that design necessarily wouldn't get picked by the selection committee, so I have to come up with something that I want to do, but is also flashy enough and interesting enough that the selection committee would actually want it. So it's kind of a combination of, you can't just build a robot that's going to be good and then get on the TV show. You have to come up with a shtick or something that's going to make it memorable enough, and that's what I'm having the issue with. So I'm kind of in a holding pattern until that idea just clicks. Because I couldn't just scale up crippling depression and bring it. There's no way I'd get accepted. So. Um, did you come up with any names for the heavyweight if we were to do one? Do you, know, you want to talk about the name? I like Psychotic Break. So Kim likes Psychotic Break. Um, psychotic Break is a good one. Um, I like Drain Bandage. Um, I think Drain Bandage would be my choice um, for a heavyweight. If it was a big hitter, um, Drain Bandage would be good. Drain Bandage. <laughs> <laughs> like, I couldn't think, we're, we're trying to like, unfortunately we did Crippling Depression as a 30, as a 30 which is pretty severe. So when you start going up the classes and up the weights, you know, anxiety attack fits as a three pounder, sure. If I ever did like a fairy weight, which is what, 150 grams, that could be like, you know, minor nuisance or, yeah. I don't know, like 
gas. Bad day. <laughs> bad day. Um, <laughs> but going up into a heavyweight, it's got to be like really bad. So psychotic brace, drain damage. Um, you know, those are kind of the names we've been toying with. So. Uh, Brendan Metz asks. How many, or how many, how much ground clearance does crippling depression have? Um, crippling depression has very, very little ground clearance. Um, the ground clearance is different on the top versus the bottom. It actually has, well, it depends. Okay, so with the weapon, with the disc underneath on crippling depression, I have one sixteenth of an inch of ground clearance. That is how much space is between the weapon and the floor with the wheels that are on it. So there's only a sixteenth of an inch with the weapon. If I take off the weapon, I think it's um, the frame is the next thing that hits. And I want to say it's around a quarter inch, something like that. And flipped upside down, it's like three eighths of an inch. So it actually has more clearance upside down, and so that's why towards the end of the competition, we were having the frame issues as you saw earlier. We ran upside down because that actually gave us more ground clearance. The robot, if it starts getting warped or tweaked a little bit, that sixteenth of an inch goes away really quickly, and so we just end up kind of dragging the weapon. So we flipped upside down, which gives us that more ground clearance to work with. But yeah, it's very small. Um, LNDS Studio says that he saw us at ABC, and ABC this year and that he built Death Storm with his dad. Oh, okay. Do I do. <coughs> you remember Death Storm? Okay. <laughs> what, what, what weight class was Death Storm? Yeah. What weight class? I, unfortunately, because of all the damage that we had, we didn't get a chance to see any of the um, ants or beetles. Usually I watch all the ants and beetle fights, but we were very busy fixing stuff. Yeah. Um, he also asks, are your drive motors direct drive or belt driven? Gotcha. So yeah, for the, um, are you asking for crippling depression or for anxiety attack? Um, either or, do both. Either or? Okay. <laughs> I'm way back in the... Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. I'll hurry up. So for anxiety attack, um, it is going to be a belt driven. So one of the wheels gets direct drive here, and then that goes to a belt for the other one. And then so it's kind of a pseudo direct. One's direct drive and one's belt drive. Crippling depression <coughs> is very similar, except for it's chain drive. So I have the motor, I have the gearbox that goes directly into the wheel. But then there's also a sprocket, and then it's a number 25 chain that drives that second wheel. Uh, some people do the motor in the middle and then go out, but I actually direct drive one wheel and then go to a chain on the other. So if the chain ever fails, one wheel still works. Um, Justin Markle asks, how are you going to deal with self-writing, I'm assuming, on the Beetle? Oh, how am I going to deal with self-writing? Um, I'm just going to lose the match. Um, anxiety <laughs> attack is not meant for self-writing, and <clears throat> as much as I thought about you know doing some self-writing mechanism, unfortunately, it's going to take extra weight, which I absolutely do not have on that design. And I think the biggest thing is I'm just going to make it so that don't flip over and do a knockout as quickly as possible. So we'll see. But it is my first kind of non-self-writing robot. So yeah, it'll be interesting. Uh, Mr. Squeaky Voice <laughs> says that they're going to plan on either making a 12 or 30 pounder to um, his sole motivation for 30 pound is to fight in the same class as crippling depression. Ooh. But yes, would a quarter inch L channel mild steel chassis welded or bolted together hold up in either a 12 or 30 pound class? Yeah. So um, I'm not sure if you're aware of the Facebook combat group. Um, it's on Facebook. It's um, Combat Robotics, I think, is the group. Uh, David Small, who may or may not be in here right now, um, he asked this question, like, how much armor is enough armor for 30 pounds, 60 pounds, stuff like that? And it largely comes down to geometry. So um, Paul from um, Bite Force came in, and he said that he only uses about a half inch aluminum on Bite Force. Bite Force does pretty well, right? And that's a heavyweight. I'm using like anywhere between a quarter inch to five eighths inch worth of armor. So it really depends on geometry. Where do you think you're gonna get hit? What's the geometry of it? So if you're saying that you're gonna do, you know, just uh, L channel and it's gonna be straight at 90 degree corners, you might have an issue. If it's gonna be maybe angled and there's a little bit of a lip there, you know, you might be better off. It just really depends on the geometry, but 
steel as armor in the thirty pound or twelve pound is generally pretty good as long as it has some support. if it doesn't have any support it's just going to bow and bend in and then you'll be out of luck. um elenius is asking a lot of questions about adc. what place did you get <coughs> that you got first? first place of course. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yep so first place um, unfortunately, last year SparkFun decided to not do medals, so I've got my first place for the amp weights. This was um, Sergeant Cuddles three years ago, um, so I won first place with Cuddles three years ago, and I won first place um, for the past two years with the featherweight, but last year they didn't have medals, so as much as I'd want to show you three of these, I only have the two. Um, but yeah, I got first place. It was a very difficult first place, but I ended up finally getting first with that. After a very long day. Yes. Um, Pearson, it looks like you had an unplanned rapid disassembly of Kirkland. Yep. Yep. It was, I mean, it was mostly planned. If anyone's been following crippling depression from the beginning, I kind of kept saying is that it should be able to keep going after it's been completely dismantled. And I finally got to prove that. With beam. Yeah, with beam. Um, you can take off pretty much all of the exterior armor panels and it will still drive. Um, so losing the front was not fun. Um, but, you know, as soon as I lost the front, I'm just like, okay, you know, that's just what kind of fight it's going to be. And I just kind of kept going. So it's made for that. Um, TMLS. Uh, how much do those gearboxes cost on the three pounder? Oh, on the three pounder? Um, let's see. I want to say so. The gearboxes on the three pounder they come with the motor, which that's kind of a bummer. I'm still talking with Servo City right now. They're thankfully one of my sponsors. I'm trying to get them to sell just the gearboxes alone because most people are buying the gearbox with the motor, throwing the motor away, and then just using the gearbox. I want to say I think these are like twenty bucks somewhere around there with the motor um, just for a single. I want to say it's like $21.95, like $22, bucks, something like that. Um, but I'm definitely talking to them to try and get them to sell just the gearbox for like less than that. Um, the brushless motor, I want to say, is like $10, $15. So this whole thing comes out to, let's just call it under $40. So it's not, it's not all that cheap. However, um, Servo City is my sponsor, so take that into consideration you can get chinese knockoffs of these much cheaper they're not as good of course um, but you can get chinese knockoffs for these i think sub ten dollars um, so you could save a lot of money if you were doing that but good gearboxes come on <laughs> <laughs> uh chris says it was nice to meet us at abc oh. um yes was chris, there any moment afterwards where you were like why do i spend hundreds of hours on a <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what was it? David Small and um, Luke um, Quinn was right next to me in the pits, and the whole time I was just like, "Why are we doing this, guys?" Because <laughs> um, David had his uh, three pounder like demolished, mm -hmm. and I think Luke had um, rum hand. He had the motor break off several times, and both of us would just kind of look at each other and like, "Why are we here? What are we doing?" <laughs> it's a really stupid hobby when you're at the event. It seems really stupid. But then you come home with a piece of shattered <laughs> tool steel and it's yeah. just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and um, just the other night we were playing around with um, the USB microscope. I hadn't thought of that, but we took the USB microscope and we're looking at all the hits and all the damage on crippling depression. And this will be in the um, damage recap video that I do. It is really neat to use <clears throat> the little microscope and look at all this stuff. Um, up close, it's really interesting seeing all the damage. So that's cool. Yeah. I don't know if that's worth, you know, ten hours of getting your thing destroyed, but <laughs> it's a slight bonus. It's playing with physics. Yeah. <laughs> but having your parents at the event oh. and <laughs> <Perfect. yeah. laughs> that's awesome. so they're still here, by the way. Um, but having them at the event and seeing it get completely destroyed and then duct taping it back together or gorilla taping it back together and seeing it actually still progress through the loser's bracket really slowly was actually pretty cool. So that, that kind of was the trade-off. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was yeah. a hell of an event. If that hadn't happened, I would just be like, it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little $5 piece of 
metal makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. We need that little five dollar piece of metal. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm still salty. We didn't get one last year. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, Doppler says, hey Robert, I'm from a new combat robot team in Brazil, oh. and I wonder if you've ever thought about making an aluminum spinning bar in crippling depression with steel inserts, so kind of like beamed in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, you know, I got a lot of criticism when I made the weapon discs. I'm going to grab it so we're not just looking at us. So I got a little bit of criticism when I designed these initially, and thankfully, I finally got to show what these are for. This isn't necessarily for hitting against someone and causing a lot of you know, impact damage or knockouts. One of the big things I like about these weapons is they can take out other weapons. So when I went tip to tip with Beam, it shattered um, his tips off. I went um, toe to toe with, I can't remember who the, it was, there's a vertical spinner at Motorama, um, but I went right up against that vertical spinner at Motorama. Sure. No, it was, it had a um, aluminum uh, bar and then it had the little inserts in it and it just flayed out the aluminum. And then I also went up against Huge, which everyone talks about too. Going weapon to weapon is what's really good about these discs. They don't get a good bite, but because they spin fast enough, it's really good at knocking out other people's weapons, which has happened quite a bit with them. So I kind of like it for that. And I think if I went over to an aluminum, Sure, I would save some weight, and I could probably you know keep the energy the same, but it would be a less durable disc, and I like having these be extremely durable. Mm -hmm. You never have to think about it. Yeah, like, it's, it just keeps going. And, yeah, know. it's a YOLO weapon. I can just run this at full speed, and I actually I aim for the weapon. If you watch the beam fight, I'm aiming for his weapon because I'm trying to break it, and I know that this disc is going to out-survive a long bar, especially something that has inserts on it. So mm -hmm. I'm looking for weak points, and this really doesn't have any weak points because it's solid. Yeah. Uh, Harun asks, um, that front plate is 7075, do you think it was better than the 6061? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, so on this version, I'm going to get some like visual aids. Oh yeah, do you have the old one? I think I have the old one, yeah. I think I have all the old ones. But you didn't fight Beam on the old one. <laughs> yeah. These are pretty. You got some impressive damage. So this is one. And this is the other. And, you know, it's really tough to say because damage is different every time. I also did epoxy on the old one. I didn't do the epoxy on this one, mostly because of time. They seem similar. Um, if we look up close, let me move the camera around. The damage is very different between them. So if we look at the 6061, you can see these large gouges and cuts. And it just looks like the material was cut out of it. And then we have these nice bends in it. So the material gave way a lot better, it seems. But then if we look at the 7075, other than this and this, the material tended to crack off. So yeah, it's a lot harder. And that's exactly what you'd think from 7075 is, I'm sure these two cuts right here took a lot of energy because it was just carved in. But generally speaking, if the material was going to give way, it just broke. So I don't really know which one's better. The funny thing is, though, is this bent. So this still bent quite a bit. So I don't really know if having the material give way easier is better than the material that stays and then cracks. I'm not really sure. I'd have to maybe do some more testing. So if you're looking for you know getting started in this, I definitely recommend uh, the RioBots book. Um, I think you can go on Amazon, you can go Google or Amazon, you can download it for free. If you can't afford the book, you shouldn't be building combat robots. And if you don't want to support the community, you shouldn't be building robots. So I would highly recommend just buying the book. Um, it's RioBots, R-I-O-B-O-T-Z, um, and you can find that on Amazon. It's pretty cheap. Uh, definitely get that book. It answers 
pretty much every single question i've ever answered here in the video and that's where kind of i get a lot of my stuff from it's a good read that's a good place to get started and then also youtube of course mutually assured destruction asks what are your thoughts on the last chance rumble controversy oh we just watched yeah we can all weigh in on that um last chance rumble controversy so um spoiler alert let's just throw down a spoiler alert. super spoiler alert spoiler alert if you haven't seen battle bots just kind of pause or mute or go away or do something like that um the latest episode of battle bots there is a rumble and there's a bit of a controversy huge controversy i hated it i hated it i hated it um duck should have won i don't care about the rules I don't care about what they were supposed to do. Active weapon damage. They, Duck should have won. They owned it. They yep. owned it. Duck should have won. Um, nothing against Bombshell. Mike Jeffries, nice guy. He's helped me out quite a bit. Um, he and I have talked about sponsorship and other things. I like Mike Jeffries. I have nothing against the robot. It didn't perform that well this season. It went 0-4. It had a couple good hits in the Rumble and then you know did the thing it did i don't think that showing is representative or is deserving of it being in the 16. however the duck fight versus bronco was fantastic the duck fight versus tombstone was fantastic and then it had two wins in addition to that one in the rumble format and then you know by all accounts it should have won that rumble so it deserved to be in the 16 whereas bombshell didn't prove that it deserved to be in the 16. It won on the technicality, but it didn't prove it. So that's my thoughts. Same here. Also, I love Duck. Yes. You guys agree? Well stated. I would agree. Yeah. <laughs> so I, if I was one of the judges, I would just said, screw it. I'm going to go with Duck, even against the rules. Um, I understand that it won because of rules, but nah, Duck should yeah. have won. Duck will be a better bot in the 16. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, Spoodle asks, what weapon would you want on your heavyweight? Um, a big one. Um, <laughs> it's asking what weapon I want on the heavyweight. I don't know yet. I'm toying with the idea. So talking with uh, Mike Jeffries and a lot of the other people on BattleBots are basically saying you got to have something that is interesting enough to get selected. And so one of the things that I was thinking of doing is just doing something really silly. Uh, so I was thinking of like you know, five foot tall weapon bar, just basically doing tombstone vertically, um, kind of more of like a nightmare type thing. Um, something like that. I think if I was gonna do it, I couldn't just make something that's really durable and really competitive because that's not what BattleBots is looking for. They're looking for something flashy and something that's crazy. So I would probably just go crazy with the weapon and do something that's just insanely damaging. Um. Alex Robots asks, are you going to make another ant weight or beetle weight? So we've talked about the beetle weight, but yeah. any plans for ants? We've talked a little bit about that. I don't really have any plans to do an ant right now. Um, typically the way it goes is you design an ant and then you realize that you're overweight and then you just say, screw it, I'm just gonna go to a beetle weight. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at right now is every time I try planning out an ant weight, I end up wanting a bigger motor, a bigger battery, or a bigger weapon, and then it just ends up being a beetle weight. So I'm probably not going to do an ant weight anytime soon. Um, I'm going to stick with the beetle weight, which is anxiety attack, and then, yeah, we'll see. Maybe go from there. Um, there's some discussion with Mr. Squeaky Voice and Mutually Assured Destruction talking about um, building the 12 or 30 uh, done in a garage with only hand tools and a welder, no mm. drill press. So. Um, Mutually sure destruction was saying uh, using a jigsaw and making some UHMW panels. So maybe just a little yeah. talk about doing things on the cheap with uh, fewer tools or. Yeah, if, if I have the time, uh, one of the things I want to do is I want to just completely ignore all the stuff I have out here in the shop and do only hand tools like hacksaw, screwdriver, soldering iron, maybe that's it. Uh, it is very possible. I know um, Charles just posted on Combat Robots that one of his first bots that he built in high school was built just with basic tools out in the garage. And it was all UHMW panels, 
uh, aluminum from Home Depot, and it was just kind of bolted together. It is totally possible to do these with hand tools. You just need to get a little bit more creative. But UHMW, HDPE are perfectly fine materials, and you can do them, you can use those materials without any hand tools. Um, I just do it this way because that's the stuff I have. Um, Sploodle asks, when are you planning on uploading the damage report? Uh, so my parents are in town, as you can see. Um, so we've been hanging out with them. After we get done doing this, we're going to go out and have lunch and do stuff together. Um, so I really haven't had a lot of time to tear this apart. As you saw earlier, it's still completely together. I'm desperately wanting to open it up and see what all the damage is, but I won't do that until I'm ready to film it. Uh, so hopefully next weekend I'm going to get around to taking this apart and doing the damage report. And then hopefully along with that, I'm going to do the recap for ABC where I put all the fights together and kind of do the analysis recap. So hopefully starting next week, you might see something from me. If you don't see a full video, I will at, very, at the very least be posting some of the slow-mo shots that I got and maybe just some pictures on my Facebook. So go ahead and subscribe to that whole Facebook page thing. <laughs> um, not sure how to say Nemag Pickle. <laughs> You got the pickle, right? I got pickle. You got pickle. Um, <laughs> do you think half inch aluminum plated with eighth inch steel will hold up in a lightweight glass? Mm, yeah, so asking about half inch aluminum with eighth inch steel, once again, it depends on geometry. It really depends on the geometry you're using. If you're hoping to just get hit by that and take hits all day, Eh, you might run into a couple issues. I think you'd be fine. It really depends on how you attach it to. Um, my front panel came off. It's 5 8 It held up to the damage, but just getting grabbed from the side is what pulled it off. So I'd say think less about the material itself and more about how it's going to go together. Uh, for instance, iron sides, if you guys remember iron sides, they had like an eighth inch skirt of titanium all the way around. And that was very difficult to get through. The fact that it was one solid piece and there weren't any seams, that made it very strong. If they had just done butted up seams like that, they certainly would have gotten one of those ripped off. But because it was one continuous piece all the way around with nice curves, that was very difficult. So it really depends a lot on geometry. Mm -hmm. And uh, Beam had, I think, just eighth inch um, titanium caps around the outside of his corner. So yeah, like on the <clears throat> yeah, I, I wish I could do something more like that. It's just my design doesn't really lend itself to that as much. Um, but definitely doing the dual materials, I think, is a very smart idea. I think the aluminum is fine, and then the steel is just there as a protector against those big impacts. Um, Mr. Squeaky Voice asks, are you going to be at Motorama 2019? I do plan on being at Motorama. Um, crippling depression. I got to see a lot about what failed, what worked, what didn't work. Um, this was, you know, completely new design. The whole chassis was 100% new, and I think the weapon block is now dead. So now I get to make all the modifications, make a new weapon block, make new drive pods, and just basically do a ground up rebuild. It's been three competitions now, so I've gotten to see a lot of what's happened. So I'm going to redesign this and bring a fully new version three to Motorama. Oh, and uh, he also said um, he's the guy that's been messaging you on Facebook, Mr. Squeaky Voice, oh. a few days ago asking when the next Q&A would be. Oh, okay. It's going to be today. <laughs> <laughs> it's about uh, half an hour ago. <laughs> so what time is it? Uh, 11-ish. Oh, okay. I'm keeper. <coughs> 10.49. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Uh, John Productions asks, when are you going to post the new fights with Crippling Depression? Yeah, so um, I kind of answered that a little bit ago. Um, hopefully within the next two weeks. I actually bought a new like action cam GoPro type thing, and I did audio recordings, but we were really bad about it, and I recorded pit footage and then turned it <laughs> off when we put it on the arena. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't get footage of all the things, but... We um, did get the beam fight. We got the beam fight. I made sure that we got the beam fight. So I actually have the beam fight um, with my own camera in 120 frames a second so I can go full slow motion on everything. And then we also have it in 
arena recording with an audio recorder. So I actually have good audio and good video from Beam Fight, but all the others are kind of meh. So I'm gonna have to like piece those together from SparkFun's feed and some other places. But yeah, I'm gonna do a full recap like I did for Motorama, um, just kind of breaking down each match and how it went along for sure. Yeah, we were a little naive in uh, how much pit time we would be using up and fixing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, humble brag, I've never really had to ever <laughs> fix anything on Crippling Depression. I've only had to like tighten some screws here and there. So we went into AVC thinking like, you know, because I've been really lucky. Like every competition with Crippling Depression, we've swapped out the battery, tightened a couple mm -hmm. screws, and then just watched all the other fights. And in this competition, we actually had to do some work. We actually had to go around and do some repairs. So we didn't really get a lot of time to focus on the video and all that stuff, so. Uh, Doppler, the, the new team from Brazil, uh, said thanks, and I will consider the YOLO factor of a weapon. Yep. <laughs> um, I make all the new members build beetle weights, and I always make them watch your videos. So. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the only thing I would say about the weapon is just there's no right or wrong way to do it. You can do a cardboard weapon if you have a reason for it. So I went with the solid S7 weapons because I have a reason for it. Um, some people are saying like you can save weight by going titanium, you can save weight by doing this way. Weight wasn't the issue. The issue was is I want something that hits really hard and doesn't break. So you can definitely do inserts with aluminum you just got to make sure that you know what you're doing and that you have a spare set or you're not going against someone that's solid S7. Like that might be an issue. You just have to kind of, you know, understand that. David Small's here. He says, good morning, Cowens. Hello, David Small. <laughs> we were talking about you earlier. Oof. <laughs> oh, no. Terror Turtle guy is back. <laughs> ah. stuff that I don't really know. Read the words. Um, the other ones talking about the Indian team wanting a guide um. for making a robot. Um, that, what, that's like 88 pounds, yeah. which I don't know what class. <coughs> um, E-bike brushed motor mm. or brushless with yeah. belly reduction. So Layla is asking a lot of technical questions. Um, I, I'm going to just say this. I'm just going to say this. 40 kilos is an 80 pound robot. That's a very, very dangerous robot. If you're asking these questions, I really recommend you start small. You can kill yourself with this weight class. If you're asking some of these basic questions, you might want to scale it back, build something small and go that route. This is a very dangerous robot you're playing to put together. So do a little bit more research and then kind of work your way up to it. Yeah. There uh, saying that they're in a school project situation, so that even more so if it's if it's a student project and you don't have much experience, it's this is scary stuff. Yeah. So generally speaking, go brushed. Don't do brushless. If I get my my general thing is if you're asking if you should go brushed or brushless, brushed is probably going to be the answer 90% of the time. You only go brushless if you kind of know the answer to that question. So start out with a brushed motor. Yeah. Um, brushless is significantly more complicated and kind of more advanced. So start with just a good brushed motor. Yeah. Uh, Brendan Metz asks, how do you generally transport your bot to these competitions? <clears throat> well, it depends on the competition. Um, for ABC, I put it in the back of my car and we drive the 15 minutes um, up to the arena. Uh, I'm actually like what, 15, 20 minutes away from the event, thankfully in Colorado. So transportation is really easy. I just kind of throw everything back in the car and just drive it up there. Uh, for Motorama, we did, we actually shipped all the tools out to my parents because they're out in North Carolina. So they met up with us and I shipped most of the stuff out to them. And an actual crippling depression was in a carry-on that was checked. Um, and so that's kind of how we did it there. Um, shipping is fine. Just give yourself a lot of extra time. Uh, you want to carry the LiPo batteries with you. So the batteries were taken out. Those were with us as a carry-on. Yeah. Um, TSA doesn't care about it as long as they're with you and they're in your control. And then the robot itself was checked. And another fun little thing is 
print out a little sheet that says, hey, this is a combat robot, here's the competition it's going to, talk a little bit about what it is, and talk about, you know, be careful with it, there's sharp corners, things like that, because your robot will absolutely 100% get checked by TSA. Every time. Every time. They will open up. They're going to run that through the um, x-ray, and they're going to be like, hmm, this looks interesting. So just put a little note in top so that when they open it up, they're aware of what it is. The last thing you want is TSA opening up and getting cut, and they throw your thing away. You know, so just let them know what's going on. And uh, when we were bringing it back, it had all kinds of gnarly, yeah. sharp edges and stuff like that. So we had like an old bath towel we wrapped it in, and we said, you know, caution, sharp, and yeah. you know, wear gloves, or just try and, I mean, help people who are you know, required to look at this stuff, then yeah. it's, it's kind of dangerous. Yeah, just give people a heads up, um, tape, you know, use some tape, tape over some of the nasty bits, stuff like that. They absolutely don't care that it's a combat robot and it's totally legal to ship, it's fine, but they're going to look at it because it's interesting and just make sure that they know what they're getting into. Uh, team Scrub asks, hey Robert, just a uh, question, what's your opinion on grabbers? Oh, grabbers. I like them. They're grabby. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, I like grabbers. Um, they're really difficult to implement because you got to have a really good drive. You have to drive it really well. And every robot is totally different, so you don't always have the right you know, grabbing. But I really do like grabbers. If I was just bored and didn't want to do weapons anymore, I'd probably do a grabber or something like that. I do a grabber before a flipper. Hey. Jeez. Is, David, is David Small still in here? <laughs> I mean, really, the hierarchy is spinners, grabbers, wedges, cardboard, flippers are somewhere down there. Dang. Whoa. Oh, <laughs> no, flippers are cool. Uh, Pierce says, so how much do I have to pay you to do these earlier? It's currently 3 a.m. and I really want to watch my policy. Oh. Uh, that gives me an idea, though. I wonder for everybody who's from different countries and this is weird times, so what if you could, e or no, no, what if um, you ask for emails for questions and we can have a list of questions oh. and talk about them, then you can watch the footage later. That's a good idea. Um, that's one way to do it because, I mean, we don't have like a ton of wiggle, I mean, like doing yeah. it in the middle of the night. So at 3.15 or 3.30, I'll answer that question. We'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, that's, actually, that's actually a good point. So it's 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. here. So if we did that earlier, then we'd be getting up at like 6. But it might make sense to do these in the evening. So maybe next one we do like Saturday evening. Maybe, yeah, we can try some different times. Yeah. But um, if you have some questions, then maybe we could just submit and then... Yeah. Um, for sure. Yeah, something like that? Yeah, we'll, we'll switch the times around or, or <coughs> do what she said. Um, this creepy yeah. voice asks, uh, how do you feel about highly destructive slash highly effective kits such as Saifu oh, being Saifu. used by a beginner? Um, this is a tough question because one side of me says that if you didn't build it and you didn't bleed on it, it's not your robot and you shouldn't bring it to a competition. That's kind of like one side of me. But then the other side of me says not everyone has all the skills necessary and just wants, you know, you want to use a kit so that you can kind of figure it out. So I kind of see it from both sides. I really don't like the concept of kits. Um, I also think if you're a veteran builder, you absolutely shouldn't be using a kit. You should build it yourself. But I understand the point of having a kit. The problem is that some of the kits are really good and really solid. And so you just, you know, plunk down $500, build the kit and start winning competitions. So I don't know, I'm, I'm really torn, but a lot of the competition is preparedness, making sure your batteries are charged, making sure all the wires are taped up, being able to drive it around, and then when something breaks, being able to fix it. So there's a lot of aspects to a competition and just simply building a robot and plunking it down is only a very small fraction of it. So I don't know, I see it both ways. I think for beginners it's fine. If, I, if it was me in a perfect world, I would say, how long have you been doing combat robots? Oh, it's less than a year. You've been less than three competitions. You can buy a kit. But if it's like, oh, I've been to like six competitions and I've been doing this for five years, you can't buy a kit. But that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a good place to start, but then you need to be more creative and progress. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. Otherwise, it's just like an RC car race. 
yeah i i like the creativity i mean that's what's so great about this is everyone is doing something different like um the kid alec that had like you know the duct tape together you know it was his first body yeah. 14 years old and it survived three minutes against angry account you know like there's a lot of ways to skin the cat what <laughs> such a weird idiom <laughs> <laughs> Um, any tips for building an antley? Um, I don't know if you want to plug your Puddles videos. Yeah, um, tips for building an antley. Um, definitely check out my early Sergeant Cubbles builds on that. You can get some tips off of that. Um, I think weight distribution is really important. Um, you can definitely check out the Riobots guide. You can also check out some of the things I've said. I think 25% on the weapon, you know, 15% on the drive, whatever those calculations are. If you look those up, you can kind of find the weight distributions. For me, when I design small stuff, I actually start with the weight distribution first. So I actually say 25% is going to be the weapon, you know, 10% is going to be the battery, 30% is going to be the frame, things like that. And kind of figure out your design goals before you really dive into building it. And if you want to build a wedge, that's fine. Uh, you can build a wedge, um, but just know kind of what those priorities are. Um, and then, you know, bias. Focus, focus on the certain aspects you want to focus on. I think with the ant weights, you can build whatever you want. It's going to come down to materials. You know, like you're not going to do a CNC aluminum chunk. You just got to kind of think a little bit more about the material selection and the weight distribution. <laughs> Teams group is begging for forgiveness for building kids. So, but, but I'm changing them, so, so can I please be removed from the group? <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been building kids for? <laughs> Uh, TML says, go brush, says the guy who goes 100% brushless. <laughs> yep. But for beginners, yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, power and easier to understand. Yeah, yeah, it's, I also, you know, I've been around the block a little bit. Um, I, you know, I released the video on how to program the Simon K. So, yeah, it's just, I, I've got a little bit more experience with this, um, especially with the motor side of it. So. I like brushless, but to do it right, they're very tricky. Keep in mind, I went through $200 with the speed controllers getting the settings right on mine. I popped four of those things in like an afternoon when I was tweaking the settings. So it's very frustrating. You can't expect to do it the night before and not blow something up. Um. Doppler, the Brazil team, says, um, I just had so many problems with my three kilogram steel horizontal spinning bar machining it and it burned my 120 amp hobby keen ESC. So I was really considering using softer materials or dual weaker motors. Mm. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I like dual motors. Um, dual motors can be very problematic, but when they work, they work well. Um, I'd, I'd look more into why you're burning out the motors. Um, one thing that I noticed very quickly is that with any friction or rubbing on the weapon, I burned out the motors very quickly. Um, so make sure everything is lined up. Make sure your bearings are lubed, your bushings are lubed. Make sure all of that is spinning as freely as it possibly can be. Um, if you can get telemetry on things and you can test it, I'd really start investigating why because 120 amps should be fine. Um, you shouldn't be burning out motors with that. So I definitely check into that. Uh, one thing that you could try is get just a cheap Hobby King ESC that has an Atmel chip on it, flash Simon K on it, that will actually help out quite a bit. So maybe do a little bit more investigating there before you start changing the weapon configuration around. Because if you're burning out the motor or the ESC, you've probably got some other issue that you need to address first. David said, grab her before flipper, unsubbed. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, Pierce said a Google Google Doc might be good if we could uh, have a Google Doc for submitting questions or something. Yeah, like yeah, we could do, because I, I already have, I don't know if I'm good at linking it, but I already have a um, Google Doc of frequently asked questions. Um, so I could do another Google Doc that's like, you know, here's questions that you want addressed. So, definitely. Um, Harun says, as a SOLIDWORKS and HSM works to Fusion 360 convert, and mostly happy about it. I'm curious if you've taken another look at Fusion 360. I haven't taken a look at Fusion 360. Um, every time I use SOLIDWORKS, it's to make a robot with a deadline for a competition. <laughs> and crippling depression is pretty complicated. Um, anxiety attack is pretty complicated, you know, when it's coming down to all this stuff. 
and the problem is, is i go over to fusion and i'm like, i don't know how to do anything and so a part that would normally take me fifteen minutes ends up taking me two hours so i go back to solidworks. i've never really had that time to just sit down and be like, oh, i want to learn fusion. i just, i've been using solidworks for over a decade now i'm just very familiar with it, so that's a big surprise. um there's a lot of discussion going on about kits here now um mm -hmm. that uh viper kit is more fair play than a saifu for a beginner because it's so competitive whereas viper is more modular semi-competitive and yeah the, the um, viper kit bugs me though um because it's it's so non-competitive like in the field now if you go up against a viper kit you're like yay i won it it's the weapon kind of comes off really easily, you know, they're, they're not as competitive as they could be, so I like the com comparison, but yeah, it's really hard. You've got to be really good to be competitive with a Viper. Like, I don't think a Viper has won a competition in a long time, so. Yeah, yeah as I said, enough drawbacks and weaknesses that it pushes you to modify it or make your own design, so it, it could be like a gateway kit. That. <laughs> gateway kit. I don't know. <laughs> Just, it has a little bit yeah. <laughs> you guys need to ask questions to them. <laughs> They've been sitting back here this whole time. <laughs> so we, we need some questions for the parents. <laughs> Yeah. It could be enough. I mean, that that's in the realm. You're in the realm. I think that's fine. Just depends on the geometry. Depends on how you put it all together. But yeah, it could be fine. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. What bots are you gonna bring to Motorama? Just Brooklyn Depression or something else planned? <clears throat> Yeah, Motorama I'm not 100% sure about. I definitely want to bring Crippling Depression because it's only, I guess there's a competition in Florida that does full combat 30s, but um, I'm definitely going to bring Crippling Depression because there's just only so many places you can bite it. I may or may not bring my Beetle. Um, I'm hoping to bring it to David Small's competition coming up. I don't know what you call it, but he's got a competition coming up November 10th. And um, that's going to be kind of its debut. And <coughs> we'll see how well that goes. If it goes really well, then it might end up at Motorama. But definitely crippling depression. Mm -hmm. uh, Team Scrub says, have you seen Blue Screen of Death? Of course I've seen Blue Screen of Death. Yeah, that, that's a really cool, that's a um, one pound crippling depression clone, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Script says I use nuts and bolts pusher kits. Yeah. Who's that? I put it on his back. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, 40 grams of weight for weapons and armors, which is how Man Ray became a good bot. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I can see it for modular that you just don't have to worry about certain pieces. I get that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, David asks, where did you find the sprockets for crippling depression? Acrobotics? Kind of looks like acrobotic sprockets with spacers bolted to them. Yeah, so David Small was asking about the sprockets on uh, crippling depression. So they originally were sprockets from Servo City. That's what I started out, version 1 and 2. Technically I'm on version like 6 now, but let's just not get into that. Um, the first two competitions used Servo City sprockets that I used my keyway set and put a keyway into them and then they were just uh, bolted to a couple spacers so that's how I made the sprockets. The current version of Crippling Depression, I don't, I don't think I can show this quickly, no. um, the current version of them actually uses custom made titanium sprockets so I water jet cut 8th inch, um, yeah, inch titanium sprockets and then I actually brought them on the mill and did the contour, um, went around, cleaned up the edges, and then actually did the contour and then put in the keyway. So those are 100% custom. And so yeah, I'm running solid uh, titanium sprockets now. Because um, overkill. Overkill, <laughs> titanium, all the things. Um, the acrobotics were okay, but with the torque, they ended up kind of expanding out. Um, the hole in the middle kind of bored them out and they started warping a little bit. So. Uh, Jake asks, are you still liking your Harbor Freight bandsaw? I know that you were having some issues. Yeah, I 
it's me. <laughs> it's not the bandsaw, it's, it's me. Um, the blade isn't perfectly up and down, and I just really haven't spent the time to get it the right way. So what's happening is it's cutting, is that working? Yeah, that's working. It's cutting like this when I'm going down, so it's getting a lot of excessive chatter and squealing. The blade needs to be like this cutting straight down, so because it's just a little bit of an angle, it's trying to cut down like that, so that's why I'm not getting as clean of cuts out of it. So I just need to do a lot of adjustment. There's a lot of adjustment on these band saws, and I just need to get in there and make it straight. But overall, it's good. It's just the blade isn't set up right. Uh, Brendan asks, who do you use for water jet? Oh, who do I use for water jet? Um, I use Rocky Mountain Water Jet up in Greeley, Colorado. Um, they've actually done some water jet work for a couple other people. Um, I've been recommending them. They do, I think their minimum job is 30 bucks. So if your job is over $30, they will do it. Um, they do do shipping. Um, contact me on Facebook or YouTube and I can get you their direct contact information. But um, I've been using them for pretty much everything now. They're really into BattleBots, which is cool. And actually the guy that um, I deal with went to AVC and he was there like since 8 a.m. till the very last oh, fight. Yeah. yeah, he was there the whole time filming it. So they're, they're into this and they kind of know what we need and what our requirements are. And I'm working towards a sponsorship with them. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, hopefully we can kind of get like a special rate or something like that. But they're really good and they can do any material. They did all my carbon fiber, they did all my S7, um, they've done all my titanium, and they actually bent my titanium wedge too. So that was pretty cool. Um, PC Fanatic says, Has you ever attempted a heavyweight or middleweight combat robot? I have never attempted anything bigger than the 30 pounder. Um, I've I've only built three. Um, I built Sergeant Cuddles, Kamikaze, and Crippling Depression. Those are the only three robots I've ever done. In various iterations therein. In various iterations, yes. Um, let's see. David has a question for the parents. Um, <laughs> um, what are your what are some of your favorite combat robots other than your sons? <laughs> I'll let you go. Well, you're talking about the 250s. I really like the Bronco. Uh, Let's talk up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I said, uh, if you're looking at the 250s, I really like Bronco, the uh, 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 combats that are going on currently. Uh, of course, Tombstone. Uh, I love Duck. Uh, <laughs> I thought Duck was awesome with Tombstone. Uh, I think uh, Jameson's bought. Sawblaze. Sawblaze is really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd say during Motorama, I really liked the fight that you had with Sawblaze. Uh, not Sawblaze, what was his called? Um, oh. Megatron. 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 Yeah. I thought those two fights were, were great. Yeah, uh, Megatron was fantastic. A lot of action. A lot of action. You want to add to this? I just, I don't remember a lot of the details about their fights, but I like the Raging Scotsman. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Really Raging Scotsman. They've got great PR. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Raging Scotsman. Good answer. Yeah. yeah. Good answer. Yeah, Raging. Um, someone's going to answer this for us, but who? Raging Scotsman is on Lucky's team? Oh, yeah. Okay. Is it Lucky? I, I saw him on there. Um, yeah. I like Counter Revolution because it's pretty. <laughs> it doesn't do very well. <laughs> Where to go here? Um, he's just wandering around. I'm just wandering. Um, ever tried a cluster bot? <laughs> mm. Yeah, I've never tried a cluster bot. Um, crippling depression had a lot of thought behind it in certain aspects. So it's crippling depression. We still don't have the name worked out, but it was kind of intended to be a 60 pounder. That's kind of why it's so beefy. <laughs> That's honey. Honey, what's the matter? Uh, Crippling Depression was supposed to be a cluster bot. Um, we we're going to do some kind of manic thing and do manic depressive as a cluster and enter it as a 60 pounder, but yeah, I just never really got there. Um, but if I, if I end up doing another version of this and we can just like buy two whole sets of everything, because I still got spares for everything, we could theoretically make two versions of this, like one with the overhead bar, one with the disc, and do it as a 60 pounder as um, manic depressive. Yeah. So, then one would be like very garish, like bright 
yeah. beautiful colors, and the other would be all matte black. Yeah. yeah. So it, that was one of the early thoughts for crippling depression, is it would make a good cluster. <clears throat> Uh, TML asks, question for your parents, are you okay that your son is making robots that are capable of killing him? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, hmm. He seems to have, he seems to have total control of them until AI comes into play. Uh, that, I, we don't really have any concerns with that. He's uh, always has been very careful with what he does. On camera. On camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, we live in another state, so we don't know all of the details. <laughs> That's um, a good question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good question. Um, Brandon, let's ask, how do you start getting sponsorships? Ooh, sponsorships. Um, I do sponsorships a little bit differently. I like to... I guess I'm in the position to where I can use something and then approach them after I like it. So um, I just talked with Matter Hackers two days ago. Um, they just came out with their new Nylon G, which is their glass fiber embedded nylon material. And I emailed them and basically said, hey, I use your Nylon X and here's how it withstood. And I you know, showed them a couple clips of like the beam fight. And I'm like, hey, it was, you know, stood up against that. I want to see how your G works. And so it shows that I'm using their product. I bought with them a lot. <clears throat> I have kind of an established, you know, I've used their stuff before and I like their stuff. And then I approach them. Um, I've also approached Bainbots and some other companies. But what I tend to do is prove that I'm their customer and prove that I like their product and then approach them after that. So same thing with Servo City. You know, I've used Servo City stuff before and I like it, so I feel comfortable being sponsored by them because it's a product that I care about. Um, I do get a lot of emails from like Banggood, Dear Best, and all the Chinese companies, and I haven't really done anything with them yet because quite frankly, I just don't use their stuff. So my approach is go after the companies that you really like and that the products you're happy with and just tell them that. They're gonna like that and then obviously have a voice and have some way to get out there and tell people that you like it. Um, Very close to you. Hi, yes you are. Um, Ketamu S. What? <laughs> I don't know how to say some of these names. Um, what are the best recommendations for DIY open source ESCs brushed and brushless? Uh, uh, DIY open source brush, like there's only a couple out there. Um, Charles is the obvious answer, um, mm -hmm. equals zero designs, is that his thing? Um, the Rage Bridge, <coughs> I think that's one of the only ones that's out there. Um, I think the Rage Bridge, there's another couple, someone else on the comments is going to throw out the name before I do. Um, they haven't really been used for combat, really. They're good open source controllers, but I don't think people are using them for combat just yet. I think really Charles is your only option other than going and buying a Hobby King and then flashing it with your own firmware. So yeah, I think Charles. Go to Charles. Get a Rage Bridge. Do your parents have plans of building robots? <laughs> oh. Parents' anger could be the name. <laughs> My mom's got a 250 that she's been working on. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> no, we downsized. We don't have enough room for yeah. <laughs> that kind of tinkering. <laughs> I don't know. I, I could see. I could see you doing a little. I could see you doing the one or a three pounder. Yeah, you think? So they're out in the Asheville area, and just recently there was um, Hickory. What was that? There was a competition in Hickory. Oh, Hickory? I'm yeah, not familiar. Yeah, it was just a month ago or so. It's a really small competition, but oh, okay. yeah, there's yeah, definitely Hickory something out there. You want to scooch over a little bit? Scooch. Okay, that way. Yeah. Here we go. Family all together. Yeah. Um, um, what time is it? Uh, 11.20. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Squeaky Voice has a tale of caution. <laughs> I spun up my first horizontal spinner in the kitchen with no protection, and it spun the wrong way, so the blade flew off the threaded shaft and teleported across the room, hitting three different walls. 
Yep. And I said, oh my God, why the kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> so wear, wear safety protection and find a suitable place to test things and have protection, please. Yep. I uh, The very first time when we were getting into combat robots, we were testing out um, Sergeant Cuddles, which was completely different, unrecognizable from what Sergeant Cuddles ended up becoming. But once we got the kind of <clears throat> the weapon design and going, we we're out at my last garage. I think you remember this. We had like a little chunk of UHMW, oh, yeah. and it was on the floor. And I drove up to it and hit it, and it just disappeared. I mean, it, literally, it was there, and then it wasn't there, and it embedded itself up in the ceiling, about like an inch away from my fluorescent lights. <laughs> so it had just gone straight up, and it was just an inch away from my old fluorescence. And yeah, it could have been really, really bad because it could have gone any other direction and hit us. And so we learned very quickly the forces involved. Um, and I am going to be doing a video uh, on this guy, my little test arena. It's not the cheapest thing to build. Uh, mine's a little bit bigger than most. Um, <laughs> but definitely having a test arena is a really nice thing to have. Um, I think that one, all in with the Lexan, is like $500. Unfortunately, the Lexan itself is a big chunk of the cost. I think the Lexan was close to $200 on it. Um, but it's it's made to be a little bit modular. You can make it a lot smaller. I think you could do a pretty good test box for maybe just a couple hundred bucks or cheaper. Or if you find remnants or scraps, you could do it even less than that. Um, but definitely a test box, if you have the space for it, is really nice to have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, people were saying Hickory Bot Battles, oh. Clash of the Bots, Wreck the Halls. I think we all in North Carolina. <laughs> Wreck the Halls. Really? So it, it's bad to be you all like this. That's yeah. to try to track. Yeah, because you could you could either just go or you could buy one of those kits. I you I'd be okay with that. Would you? <laughs> <laughs> I would be shamed though. No, no, no. Don't be shamed. <laughs> <laughs> no kit shame. <laughs> saying, I think this is talking about uh, ESC's VESC and O-Drive. Yeah, O-Drive. O-Drive is the one I was thinking of. Yeah, people were saying O-Drive is amazing, a bit expensive though. Yeah, and VESC. Um, VESC is okay, but oh, is that what it is? yeah. Well, I mean, either way, VESC. VESC. Um, that's used a lot for like um, longboards or like skateboard type stuff. Oh, um, yeah, it's used for that. Um, the problem with I don't know. I, I've never used it, so I have no personal knowledge of this, but I know that's what um, Chad and um, Pete are using on their drum spinner, 60 second oh, okay. shell spinner. And they've, I don't know, I, they can speak to it, but they've been having a lot of issues. Mm. Like, I don't know, they've been having a lot of BSC issues. Okay. Uh, PC Fanatic asks, have you thought of getting into pneumatics? Ooh, I haven't thought of pneumatics yet. Um, I'm gonna leave that to the flipper people. Uh, I think what's interesting about combat robots is everyone kind of has a style, and I'm not sure what my style is yet, but I kind of like horizontal spinners. Um, so I don't really know what you do with a pneumatics with a horizontal spinner. Um, but yeah, I, I want to play with it, but I kind of like just talking with other people that do it and learning a little bit off of that. But um, I don't think I'm ever going to make a flipper. I like them, but I just don't think I'm ever going to go there. Um, let's see. Maps are scary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brendan asks, how much was your CNC mill set up? Uh, my CNC mill was a lot. I have kind of all the bells and whistles. Um, so there is my setup. Um, this is a fully decked out 440. So I've got um, so 440 Tormach PCNC. I've got the tool changer, I've got the power draw bar, and I've got the fog buster on here. So fully outfitted. I want to say this is like between 12 and 14. I kind of got these things all over a um, long time frame. I've kind of gotten this over a couple of years, but if you were to buy this kind of exactly as it stands right now, it would be about 12 to 14. So it's reasonably expensive. However, if you were to just get the mill without the enclosure, without the stand, it's about like 5,500. So it's really not that bad just for the mill. Um, you do have to have a controller and stuff like that, but 
if you don't need any tooling and you don't need the enclosure, don't need the stand, don't need the power draw bar or any of that stuff, you can do it for about six thousand pretty well equipped. Yeah, these things are expensive. Yeah. Tonto wants to see us throwing something at the anxiety attack weapon. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to see this. Um, <laughs> it's not in that configuration yet. Um, so the the, the setup that's in there right now is not made for impact yet. The um, motor isn't battle hardened yet, and it's just simply direct drive. It doesn't have this housing on it or anything yet. This housing will let it hit things. Right now, I think I'm going to break the motor. So eventually, eventually, keep watching. I will be, I will be doing some hits with that soon. Just okay. not, not right now. Um, Alex said, I noticed that the drive motors you were using on crippling depression were rated for 4S, but used a 6S battery. Did you notice any positive or negative effects on the overall <coughs> thing? Yeah. So this is a good question. Um, I think I'm going to make this as a whole video, but I'll try and sum it down a little bit. Brush motors. Okay. So you got a brush motor. Power comes in, it goes in through these little brushes, they're carbon or graphite, and the power goes into those, they press against the armature thing and make it spin, and when it spins, it changes phases, which makes the whole thing spin around like a motor. That's how brushes work. A brushed motor is typically gonna have a rating, six volts, 12 volts, 24, whatever. That's basically the rating on the voltage that the brushes can handle. If you go too high, you'll get a lot of sparking and pinning on those brushes and they will wear down and your motor will end up dying prematurely. So that's brushed. <coughs> With brushless, you don't have brushes because it's brushless. So you don't have those. So the way it works is you're actually controlling the armature itself and you have three wires that come out of a brushless motor. Those three wires, you go pulse, 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 pulse. You're basically pulsing them much like you would a stepper motor, and that's actually what makes the spinning happen. This is the reason why if you take a brushless motor and hold it, it will kind of jerk back and forth because it doesn't know where those poles are. So that's why brushless can be kind of tricky because when it starts going, you can pulse it and you can get it running in the speed and the direction you want, but if it stalls out, you're going to be trying to turn it in an unknown direction, whatever. And that's where sensored motors comes in because they actually have a sensor to detect those poles. So the original question is voltage. Because they don't use brushes, there really is no limit to how much voltage you can put into these. Motors on Hobby King, for some reason, are specced at certain voltage ranges, but it doesn't really matter. You can go higher, you can go 12S, 20S, 24S, you can go as high as you want with it without really any downside. You will obviously heat it up, you're going to be putting more energy into it, but basically the voltage that you put into it is going to be higher RPM. And that's why there's the KV rating. A 100 KV motor will run a 100 RPM per volt. So if you do 10 volts, it's 1,000. If you do 100 volts, it's going to be 10,000. So really, the voltage just gets it spinning faster. So for my brushless drive, I run it at 6S, which gets it spinning much faster, gets some inertia going, and that actually helps with the responsiveness of the drive. Totally understandable. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So really, the short of it is you don't really need to worry about voltage with brushless motors. You very much do with brushed motors. And with brushless, the extra voltage, actually, your current will always stay the same. So if, you're, if the motor is rated at 20 amps, it will, you know, it will draw 20 amps worth of current. If you're running at 10 volts, that's 200 watts, you know, roughly. If you run it at double that voltage, you actually get double the wattage out of it. So generally you want to run these things as high voltage as you can because you will get more power because the current rating is going to be pretty much fixed. Um, Doppler says, I'm also finishing building a Beetle Arena and it's mm. two by two by one meter with eight millimeter polycarb. Oh, meter. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you have any suggestions about arena weapons I can try to put into it? Oh, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not personally a big fan of arena hazards. 
uh, but at the very first spark fun arena we actually had an old um uh, scooter motor um i forgot what those things are called but you know the black can scooter motors that were really common uh, we had one of those with a saw underneath and i think there was just like a little arm mechanism that would bring it up and down i actually like saws i think saws are pretty cool i also like the um, turntable design where you have a circle in the floor and someone can control it so when the robot drives it across it it just spins and I, I think that's whose arena is that that has that where it actually can drop down spin them like and then that. actually pop up and it flings them out that's a really cool I actually really like that one uh -huh. um, because it's not doing inherent damage but it's kind of mixing things up and kind of disorientating you so I like that one John Productions uh, disagrees with our comment on the Viper because uh, he got second place with one. Okay. So. There's always an exception to every rule. Yep. <laughs> Did you do any modifications to the Viper or is it completely stock? Don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out. Um, <laughs> uh, John Bonato asks, have you had any issues with backlash on your Tornock for a lot of our stores? Yeah. So... I'm just trying to think of the long story short here. Um, I have had some issues with backlash. It's really difficult to build a CNC machine cheaply that's not going to have any backlash. Uh, Tarmok uses dovetail waves, so they're just basically dovetails like this. The table fits into that dovetail, and then it uses a gib strip, which is a tapered strip of brass or some other type of wear material that slides in between those two dovetails and depending on how far it slid in or out it will change the thickness or how tight those two pieces made up it is a common design but it is prone to failure because as things wear more it will wear against that gib strip and then you will have a little bit of play um, i have had a little bit of play in my machine it really comes down to adjustment i don't think you can expect to spend this might sound weird, but you can't expect to spend $10,000 on a full CNC machine and not do any maintenance of it. That is why Haas exists. That's why the Brother machines exist. That's why those exist for twenty dollars and 30000 and up. At a $10,000 machine, you're going to be getting dovetail ways and you're going to have to do some adjustment. So look at some of my earlier videos, look at some other videos from John Saunders or other people, and you know, just kind of learn on how to adjust a mill. You will have to do like uh, maybe every six months, you'll have to go in there and do some adjustments, but it can be, you can adjust that slop out. So. Um, Decker Rogue says to impress the BattleBot selection committee, what about a 45 degree spinner? A 45 degree spinner? Is that like um, Oh, like at an angle? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could... Drive issues. I mean, you could do something like that to impress the committee, but you wouldn't be impressing yourself. Um, angled weapons are really, really problematic. Um, when things spin, they want to spin, I guess, um, flat against the axis. So it's going to want to spin <coughs> flat against this axis or flat against this axis. So that's why you see drums, when they turn they go up on the edge because of the centripetal acceleration and also when you get hit with a vertical or a horizontal spinner they just go up and down it doesn't want to tilt so if you inherently tilt that it's gonna want to wanna flatten yeah, out so yeah it's a difficult design and um you know ben from team panic kind of learned that a little bit is when you do an angled weapon they want to flatten themselves out so yeah it comes a little squirrely um, somebody says, hi Rob, this is Ray from China. I oh. want to know how you think of Chinese events and current 15 kilogram bots. Chinese events are getting really good. Um, I, I've never really talked to you directly, but I've seen a lot of your posts and comments. So hello, nice meeting you. Um, I think the Chinese events are getting really good. And I think we're going to have to start having more U.S. competitions to make up because a lot of our bots are going over to China to fight in all the Chinese events. So yeah, I'm really curious to see where that's going to go i haven't applied to any of the chinese competitions just because of time and travel you know it just takes a lot of time to get over there and everything but um yeah there's some really good competitions out there so nice job david said that the dark arena has that spinner oh the dark one yeah, yeah. that's the one in um, texas yeah 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 um yeah sorry i said uh 
warheads crazy dance all over again. It's like combining the worst of horizontals and verticals all together. Yeah. For the tilted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they're the only ones that do that and do it well. Yeah. But yeah, it just Whoop. goes yeah. all over the place. But they have so much articulation that they have a lot of control over yeah. stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. Well, not now. Oh. Oh, too soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of the international folks have uh, left because it's late. Okay. Um, Does anyone have any more questions? We might wrap it up and um, go get some lunch. Yeah. Mexican. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Colorado specialty. Colorado Mexican. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We good? Nothing coming through. Okay. What's the time? It is 11:36. Okay, it's not bad. Cool. So unless anyone has any questions in the next 10 seconds or so, we're probably going to head out. Um, I'll hopefully get some videos coming up um, in the next week or so. Check out the Facebook page. Um, I'll be doing little updates here and there. I already have some very, very cool slow motion um, that these yeah. guys have already seen. Mm -hmm. um, I've sent it to a couple of you. I think David Small has it. Um, but yeah, I've got some cool slow motion from the Beam 5. I just need to put it all together and get it out there. So. Um, two last call okay. questions. Squeaky Voice asks, what material and thickness would you recommend for an articulated, actuated wedge at 12 or 30 pounds? Oh, articulated wedge. Oh. That really, that's a tough one. Um, it really depends on how you're attaching it. I think my feeling would be you go two routes. You go aluminum and you do maybe like half inch, maybe one inch thick aluminum, depending on how your configuration is set up and assume that the aluminum is going to bend and that you're probably gonna to have to bend it back or just go with something like a hard ox, um, go with like a, you know, AR 400 or a hard ox clone, do something like that. It, it's really hard because you can go with the welded, it won't break, or you can go with aluminum that will bend and absorb the impact. It really depends on your design. It's a tough question to answer directly. We're getting invited to several different countries right now. So. <laughs> oh, invite. Right. Okay. Oh, true. Ray said, uh, thank you for your compliments. We're always open to you and crippling depression for okay. the Chinese event. <laughs> China um, is open to crippling depression. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he's hoping that they can send a bot to Motorama in the future. Okay. That would be cool. Yeah. Uh, Dapper said, thanks for answering questions. Uh, you have to come compete in Brazil. We have a really competitive featherweight class. Uh, so yeah. I see travel in our future. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think, um, I definitely think we could travel someplace because there's a lot of featherweight competitions and I've seen the featherweights in China. I, I think we could do pretty good. I think we could do well. Um, I think you need a road crew to go with you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> hey. Nominations, yeah. <laughs> um, Alex put in a last question. Is there a reason why you didn't use a timing belt on crippling depression? Ah, yes. Um, that's a very good question. There's two answers for that. I didn't use a timing belt. Um, let me talk about the drive. I don't know if you're talking about the drive or the weapon. I didn't use a timing belt for the drive on crippling depression because of width. So in those drive pods, I have a bearing, I have the hub for the actual wheel, then I have the sprockets, and then I have like some spacers and other things, and then I actually have the motor. The shafts are not that long, so if I went with a timing pulley, I would actually double the width. Chains are a lot thinner, so I can do a chain in less uh, width than I can for a timing pulley. So that's why I went with that. The original plan was to go with a timing pulley, but you always have to have flanges on the outside so the width just started becoming too big. And also, I just like the robustness of the chain. I didn't do it for the weapon for similar reasons. Um, the whole thing is custom. All the pulleys are custom and everything's custom machined and doing a timing pulley profile is a lot more difficult than doing just a simple um, uh, serpentine profile, which is what I did. So I didn't do the timing for there, and I also wanted to slip. A timing pulley or a timing belt and pulley won't slip, and so that's the reason I didn't do a chain there, is because I actually wanted that little bit of slip, and timings won't do that. They will just snap instead. So. Um, Zach asks, how do we convince Casey to let us use his arena for local casual meetups? Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he's out of state, so what's he going to do? <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I, I would. We'll have to talk to them because um, you thinking of like the ant or the beetle? Because yeah, I mean, I could probably fit the um, ant or beetle here in my shop. So if we could just get it and someone could help set it up, we could totally just have really casual events here. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, just set up the arena and just kind of throw in your bot and play around. Yeah. So. Um, Ray said about ABC, what do you think of Yahoo? Huh. We, we felt that. Um, <coughs> It, it tore a couple of impressions wedge off before dying, and it also beat our eventual second place pretty badly before losing. Yeah, yeah, Yahoo is a pretty good robot. Um, their drive has issues, as we saw at ABC. Um, yeah, drums, these really good, powerful drums are always difficult to face, and I just made a horrible mistake by trying to use the wedge. Mm -hmm. um, the wedge was not made for drums, and I don't really know why I was going against them with the wedge. I just didn't think about it. Um, also, we were dragging the weapon. We were having some severe weapon issues on that first fight. That was the first fight of the day. We were dragging the weapon and also had a lot of extra friction, which we fixed later on. So our weapon died you know, a minute into it, and then we ended up using the wedge, and th those were just bad decisions. Yeah. Um, well, it, it felt very weird in the beginning. It felt weird. Yeah, we blew both weapon motors and uh, uh, yes, motor yes. controllers. Mm -hmm. or ESCs, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it just felt really weird. We weren't driving right. We were dragging that weapon along. Yeah, because usually... It had too much uh, tension on the belt. Too much tension on the belt. And usually drums are the ones that I'm very comfortable fighting. I'm very comfortable fighting a drum because when the weapon gets up to speed, you can't flip us, you just kind of pop us up in the air, and typically we can hit something up front and kind of tweak the drum. Mm. So usually drums are kind of like my safe bet for fighting, but we had a real issue with them because the weapon ended up stopping and just wasn't working. Um, the weapon really absolutely needs to keep working on crippling depression for it to do what it's supposed to do. And so when it stops, it's just, it's all out yeah. the door, out the window, it's out somewhere. It's out. It's out. It just doesn't work the same way. Great. I asked, did the drum bite into the wedge? I can see they're getting a hold of it before the fight. Yeah. Off. It just barely grabbed. It's not the most robust wedge, um, but you can see just right there, it just grabbed and it just lifted. There's a little bit of lift here. It just lifted it and then it just pulled all of these bolts straight out. Um, so yeah, it just, it just got a really good bite underneath, grabbed it and then just lifted it off. So we really shouldn't have been using the wedge for anything that spins vertically. It wasn't designed for that at all. It was primarily designed for horizontal spins. <clears throat> how epic are you? Very epic. Very epic, like the most epic <laughs> of all. <laughs> I think that's about it. <laughs> Why would they even ask that, Kim? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool, we're signing off. Um, look for some updates and some videos in the next couple weeks. Thank you.